The interscaling brachial plexus block is a technique that's been used by anesthesiologists for 50 years. There was a time when, even if you only knew two to three blocks, interscaling was probably one of them. We still use it routinely for shoulder and upper limb surgery, and in this video we'll discuss the technique and some key safety points to keep you out of trouble. The goal of the interscaling block is to place local anesthetic right next to the brachial plexus sheath at the level of the C5 and C6 nerve roots. These roots come together to form the superior trunk, and whether you do the block where they're single roots or one trunk doesn't seem to influence the clinical effect much. Here's an ultrasound image showing the brachial plexus contained within its sheath and a puddle of local anesthetic right beside it. This is the image you're aiming for at the end of the procedure. The interscaling block anesthetizes the C5 and C6 roots, and so this is well suited to procedures of the shoulder and upper arm, including the clavicle, the proximal humerus, and the scapula. In the old days with larger volumes, we'd use interscaling for procedures as distal as the elbow or proximal forearm, but with the targeted technique we use now, it's primarily proximal arm and shoulder. There are other ways to anesthetize parts of the shoulder and surrounding structures, but if you want to do wide awake shoulder surgery, interscaling is what you want because it fully anesthetizes the relevant skin, muscle, fascia, and bone of the whole shoulder girdle. For positioning, you want to have good exposure to your working area. Turning the patient's head away and placing a bump under the ipsilateral shoulder can help. Turning the patient on their side is also a great way to give yourself lots of room, especially when we're placing catheters. Placing an ultrasound transducer on the anterior lateral neck one to two centimeters north of the clavicle should get you an image like this. You can see the posterior aspect of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the anterior and middle scalene muscles, and the string of black pearls that is the interscalene brachial plexus nestled between the scalenes. Sometimes these roots can be hard to pick out of a static image, and for that reason we recommend doing some dynamic scanning. Slide the transducer down to the clavicle until you see the subclavian artery and the honeycomb of plexus anterior lateral to it. The artery makes a great landmark. Then it's an easier job to scan up the plexus until you see the C5 and C6 roots distinctly. We see the C7 root here too, although you may not always. It's not important for our purposes and we're not going to target it. Now that your probe is in the right position, the needle can be lined up and advanced from the lateral aspect. Okay, so let's look at this in real time. Here we see the anterior and middle scalene muscles and the C5 and C6 roots between them. The needle is coming across the screen from the lateral side. Note the space between the C5 and C6. This is a useful target to aim for. You don't ever want to contact either of these sensitive nerve roots with your needle. As the needle passes through the fascial covering of the middle scalene muscle, you may feel a small give. A test injection shows the injectate spreading up and down along the side of the plexus. The needle is advanced a little more so it's within the puddle of local and the remainder of the dose injected. You don't have to flood this area. 10 to 15 mils are more than enough to ensure a quick onset, high quality block. The choice of local anesthetic obviously depends on your goals for onset, duration, and block density. Now, I wanna emphasize that the brachial plexus sheath is not a diffusion barrier. In other words, local anesthetic placed outside the sheath easily diffuses across and quickly anesthetizes the nerve structures. You don't need to actually get inside with your needle. And in fact, we really shouldn't. In this cadaveric study, investigators placed needles within the sheath or just outside and injected a tenth of a mil of black ink. The cadavers were then dissected to see what the disposition of the ink was, and in the periplexus group, outside the sheath, there was no staining of the nerve structures, which is what you'd expect with that volume. In the intraplexus group, most of the ink was between the C5 and C6 roots, which is great, except that they found that the remaining 12% showed ink staining within a number of fascicles. Look how many of the fascicles are involved here with one tenth of a mil. Now we know that local anesthetic within fascicles predisposes to chemical nerve injury, to say nothing of the potential for mechanical needle injury by getting too close. So the upshot of this study is stay outside the sheath. There are a few other nerves in the neck and you have to be aware of the potential for phrenic nerve blockade and injury to the dorsal scapular and long thoracic nerves. We've known for decades that even small volumes in the interscaling groove leads to phrenic nerve blockade and hemidiaphragmatic paresis. Here we see 10 mils of dye spilling up and over the scalene muscles, and since the phrenic runs on the surface of the anterior scalene, it's gonna get blocked. Patient selection is important here, and in another video we talk about alternatives to interscaling block for patients who may not tolerate a reduction in their pulmonary mechanics. Here we see the middle scalene muscle and the plexus medial to it. The long thoracic and dorsal scapular nerves often pass right through this muscle, and if you're not careful, they can be at risk for needle trauma. 
We like to keep our needle trajectory superficial in the muscle until reaching the plexus to avoid these nerves, which are usually somewhat deeper at the interscaling level. Nerve stimulation can also help identify potential needle nerve contact. In summary, the interscaling brachial plexus block is an excellent technique for upper limb surgery that has stood the test of time. It can provide standalone surgical anesthesia for shoulder and upper limb procedures and is our go-to for post-operative analgesia in shoulder patients. As with many blocks, there are some delicate structures to look out for, and the risk of neural injury can be minimized by staying outside the sheath.